Well, let me simply begin by saying that I'm glad to be here. Jan and I have looked forward to this day, but we're also grateful to see so many of you. Some I've not seen in a long time, and then uh, others of you I see from time to time. But thank you for being here, and Pastor Steve, thank you for the opportunity. Janet and I love you, and Vicki, and you probably know this, but Steve and Vicki are celebrating their 39th wedding anniversary today. So congratulations. Um, Vicki, there is great reward in heaven for you. So um, that's what they say about all of us. So we're grateful for them and how God has used them. Over 35 years ago, uh, Ernie Simmons would drive to Woodstock to hear me in the old building downtown in my early days a little bit beyond 1986. And then we begin to dream about a church over here. So really, we had the opportunity to start over 125 churches, but it can only be one that's the first one. This is the first one. This church was started in a burned out motorcycle shop called Paulding Baptist Church. And today, new seasons. And so um, I'm grateful for how God has used Steve to lead the church to its greatest days thus far. And I believe the best is yet to come. If you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to be teaching from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, I've been assigned to speak on um, generosity and biblical financial stewardship, and yet to try to stay within the context of your series on Joseph. So I thought the best thing I could do is tell you what I've known through the years about Joseph. First time he's mentioned in the Bible is Genesis 37. And the Bible says about Joseph, here comes the dreamer. The word dream is the same word for visionary. It's the same word for prophetic revelation. And so here's a dreamer. Now, he gets off to a rough start because he meets with his brothers and he said, God showed me a dream and there's coming a day that all of you will bow before me. Didn't go over real good. And so as a result, uh, the Bible says his brothers hated him. Maybe you know the story. They wanted to kill him. A couple of his brothers said, no, we're not going to kill him. But they threw him into a deep pit. Let me say this about pits. Uh, unless God sends somebody along, unless God gets involved, you're not coming out. But I'm grateful that the Lord is teaching something about how he uses people. Listen to this. Joseph's life starts, if there were one key phrase, it would be this, in obscurity. There would have been a day would have said, who's Joseph? And it's true really in all of our lives. Here's how Jimmy Draper put it. God is preparing you for what God is preparing you for. And so you go through these difficult times. Now listen to this. Oftentimes in difficult times, people quit. And they just give up and they say, I'm not going back to church. I'm not going to serve the Lord. When the truth is, God was preparing you for what he has prepared for. Matter of fact, I make a statement often, I'm going to make it again. Anybody can quit. It just takes no effort at all just to finally say, hands up, I surrender, I quit. But to press through during times of obscurity. And by the way, it is in the dark rooms of our life that God develops us. And so he's developing something here. So what happens? They throw him in the pit. Well, you know what happened? A group came along, a caravan, uh, saw him, took him out, and took him to a city, sold him into slavery. You know the story. He ended up in Potiphar's house. He had not been there too long until there were some false allegations against him. And as a result, he went to prison. Listen carefully. What did he do in prison? He led. He was a leader in prison. He raised the standards in that prison till he became the talk of that time. And so what do we do in those times of adversity? So there's obscurity. There's adversity. But ultimately, God is going to get him where is the second command in Egypt. And now he's moved into a place of prosperity. 
but he would have never known prosperity, by the way, and been able to help so many others. And by the way, that's why God blesses us. We are blessed to be a blessing. And so God wants us to minister to others. If God ever blesses you with influence or God helps you in some way in your life, you should use the platform God gives you in order to bless others, to use it for his glory and for other people's good. And so Joseph is a beautiful picture of that. And the Bible wraps it up in chapter 50 about Joseph and says this, what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. And sometimes there's things that go in our life that really are not good. You ever done something you wish you could undo? Ever said something you wish you could take back? And we can't. Aren't you grateful for the grace of God that there can be confession and repentance and God can bring restoration? Now, in the text that I'm going to deal with today, there's a, a church. I would definitely say the church at Macedonia was a church of obscurity. I would tell you that this church went through great adversity. I'm going to show it to you in the Bible. But I'm going to show you that God used them ultimately to be a church that's noted as a church that was not only prosperous, but I entitled it this. The South Inspires the North. So what are you talking about? The offering is for the church of Corinth to receive in order to give the poor Jews in Jerusalem. In other words, chapter 8, verses 1 through 9 is a biblical record of how to take a love offering, when there's a great need and how to meet that need. And so in that particular text, here's what you're going to see. God is going to use the inspiration of a people called the Macedonia church. But God is going to use as an example the Lord Jesus. Here's a good way to say it. Jesus never challenged us to do anything he's not already doing. He becomes the model. He becomes the example for us to follow. So I want you to listen as I read this text. I'll kind of give a little commentary as I go along. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Listen to verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God. If I had a pencil and I was underlining something in my Bible, I would underline these words. The grace of God. This is a story about the grace of God. The grace of God is the ability of God working in our lives. There are some things that I can do that I couldn't do until I experienced the grace of God. For instance, when I was 16 years old, I was told that in about a week, I had to give a public book report. No way, Jose. I was not in the public speaking. Craziest thing I ever did, I quit school. Four years later, after managing a pool room, God saved me, and guess what he did when he saved me? By the grace of God, made the very thing that I despised, the platform I'd use for rest. I've been reporting ever since. I mean, so God used, so here's the bottom line. Sometimes somebody says, I sense, this is Christ. I sense God's calling me to do something, but I don't think I can do it. Don't raise your hands when you sing that he is the God of the impossible if you're going to then turn around and tell you how you can't do it. If God's called you to do something, through the grace of God, God supernaturally enables you with his ability to do it. No, I can't, but God can. Moses asked a question in the Old Testament. It's always blessed me. It's a rhetorical question. It needs no answer. He said, is anything too hard for the Lord? I'm thinking I could feel um, Steve's pain. I, I, I raised just under $100 million for buildings while I was at Woodstock. In my 33 years, just under a $100 million campus. We were building the whole time that I was there, right up to the very end, and paying the whole time. So I know it's pain when he says, we're not there yet. Uh, I, I loved, I remember I stood up years ago and I told our people, Steve, be encouraged. I said, Steve, don't you worry. Everything you need is already there but it's in their bank accounts. All right, so uh, <laughs> sometimes we're praying and we're saying, oh, God, send it. He already has. Yes. The, the problem is not in God sending it. The problem's in God's people 
Say it. And so the Bible says it's the grace of God in verse number one. And the Bible says it was bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Let me tell you who you'll find in Macedonia because you'll recognize these churches. The church of Philippi, the church at Thessalonica. How about Berea? Those are the churches of Macedonia. The Bible says in verse number two that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy. Now hold on just a moment. Hold on, look at me. Was there affliction or joy? Answer, yes. How, how could we have joy in the context of our greatest affliction? I, I've just gone through and still am a pretty difficult time in my life. I'm gonna be honest before God and give God glory for the grace of God. Our family has experienced a supernatural measure of God's favor. I'm telling you, just because there's great trial does not mean there can be great joy. Now, how do we know this biblically in the person of Jesus Christ? Hebrews chapter 12. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And yet he completed what he came to do. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What are you saying, Pastor Johnny? I'm telling you when the Lord Jesus Christ was on the cross, here's what I'm telling you. You were on his mind. Uh, someone says, you really believe? No, I know that. I know that God knew the beginning and the end. And so there while he was on the cross, I can't help but in my sanctified imagination to believe that he may have been thinking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And here's what he's thinking. As he's dying, he's suffering in shame. He, uh, he is enduring uh, all that the cross brought his way in his humanity. And yet, I think when he would think forward, he's thinking, what I'm doing on the cross, shedding my blood, dying, a substitutionary death, I am actually providing for those who one day, God the Father will perform a wedding ceremony between the Lord Jesus Christ and the church. Revelations chapter 19. And when he does that, what joy that will be. And so he says that uh, in the abundance of their joy, wait a minute, in their deep poverty, look at the contrast. I mean, I love the circle contrast in my Bible. In their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is it poverty or is it riches? Both. Pastor, how is that? Well, first of all, let me say thank you for asking. We, we minister, we haven't been able to go in two years because of civil war and because of gangs. But my wife and I have been maybe a dozen times to Haiti. It's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Now, hold on just a moment. Why do you go? Because we have seven life goals, seven life goals, and one is touch poverty. Why, why? Because I was raised in a government project. I was raised in poverty. Dad checked out when I was seven. I was raised by a single mom, and uh, mom worked two jobs. Uh, she worked in a factory at daytime, came home, cooked dinner for us, and then uh, walked, walked, we didn't have a car, walked downtown to White Front Grill and waited tables. And so I, I want to touch poverty. Wait, wait a minute, there's something else I want to do. I want to model generosity. Well, let, let me tell you why a lot of people never give a second thought to what I just said. Well, I'll tell you what, if I was rich like so-and-so, I'd give too. When the Lord Jesus Christ wanted to give a model of generosity, oh, this is good. He chose the poorest woman in the Bible. He, 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 he chose to tell the story of a woman that gave two mites, and he said this. That's all she had. Matter of fact, Jesus, watching the offering, said this. She's given more than anybody else in the room because she gave out of her poverty. My wife went into a house with several other women, into a Haitian house with a lady that was a teacher in one of the schools in Haiti. So all of us guys were waiting outside, waiting for them to come. In a moment, they come out, and there's a lot of tears. And so I'm wondering what's going on. And so my wife comes and shows me a bracelet. This lady would make bracelets to sell to help subsidize her income for a family living in poverty. 
And so um, I took my phone, and God supernaturally, instantly gave me this statement. Here it is. You don't have to be rich to be generous. You have to be generous to be generous. So Jesus says, I, I want to find a person, and I want to find a person who is impoverished that can give their riches. So, so which is it? Is it poverty? Look at your Bible. Is it poverty or riches? How can God give riches through someone that is poor? So you know what you've done? You, you've checked yourself off. You've checked out like, well, it don't matter. My, my, mine ain't going to make a difference. Sure, it'll make a difference. Anytime you obey God, it makes a difference. And it's really, and really what it is, here's what it is. You may say, oh, I helped met a, made a need, need, but you did more than that. You, dis, <laughs> you displayed the grace of God. God working in your life. And so what a beautiful picture. All right, look on in the text. That was in verse number three. It says, he said, you not only gave, but you gave beyond your ability and they were free willing. That means no, nobody put pressure on them. Hey, look at me for a moment. I, I love to just write one-liners and maybe you take them home with you. Giving is never in the Bible, in the context of God's grace, seen as an obligation. It is seen as an opportunity. Right. You, you want to join. Matter of fact, I'm going to read the next verse and I'm going to go ahead and set it up for you. Listen to this. The church at Macedonia was so poor that when the church at Corinth sent Titus around to take an offering, they did not even put the church of Macedonia on the list. Why? They can't give to too poor. Don't go over there. And then word got to some of the members down at the church of Macedonia. This is awesome. Oh, I like this. Baptist. I love to tell Baptists this. Listen to this. You know what they did? You know what they did? I haven't been talking to y'all as much over here. I mean, you know what they did? They begged to be involved. Please, please, I'm going to show you. You're going to show you the text. Please let us be involved. Please get, we implore you. It literally means we beg you, let us get in on the offering. Yes. <laughs> so it is, here it is, verse four, imploring. Imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Oh, by the way, they didn't just see it as giving a gift. You know, you know what they thought of? This is awesome. Sometimes we use the word too narrowly. We say, you know, I like, I like going up to our church in New Scenes because there's good fellowship. What do you think about his fellowship? Everybody's greeting one another and all. Did you know the word fellowship translates also in the Greek New Testament partnership? You, you partner with God's family. And not, none of us can do alone what all of us can do right. together. Yeah. Matter of fact, in Proverbs chapter 6, when God wants to magnify getting something done, you know what he illustrates? The ant. Hey, have you ever watched ants? I mean, if you don't have anything to do this afternoon, go home and see if you can find some ants. Hey, where are you going, honey? I'm going to just go out in the yard and find some ants. What for? Watch them. Pastor Johnny says, let me tell you what you'll find. Honest to God, let me tell you what you'll find. They'll be carrying stuff that's bigger than they are. These little old ants. And the Bible says they don't even have a commander. The locusts have a commander. The ants don't. They're just out there just doing whatever they can do to help carry the load. Uh, if you're, it would never happen here. So please, this is not for you. It's just so you can maybe get a laugh out of it and tell somebody else, but it's not for you. Here it is. I used to be a hobo Christian. Hobo Christian, yeah. I hitched a free ride on somebody else's train. For, for instance, when I got my first car, I'd go to Wrightsville Beach. I lived in Wilmington, and, and I would circle around. And somebody said, well, won't you park? Can't right yet. What you looking for? Looking for a car that paid a lot of money on the meter. When they leave, I'm going to park on their nickel. <laughs> Now, it would never happen here. Like I said, it's not for you. But could you imagine if you don't give, you're parking on somebody else's nickel. Somebody asked me one time, said, Pastor Johnny, do you believe in UFOs? 
I said, oh, yeah, absolutely. They said, you do? You believe in UFOs? Yeah. I said, I pastor a bunch of them. <laughs> UFOs? Yeah. Uncommitted, freeloading, onlookers. I, not here. I'm, I'm meant for you, weren't meant for you. I'm just letting you in on some stuff that I've learned through the years that I used to teach in church. Because the last thing I want to do is to offend anybody, and then you get along with God, and God show you that I was right. That's the last thing I would want to do, all right? I mean, God, for, God forbid that the service would be so intentional that it could actually, oh, this would be some change somebody's life. I'm through with those. I'm not going to give any more of those. So you can stay to the end, I think. So he's begging to be in. Look what he says in verse number five. And not only as we have hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. God knows that if you'll give yourself to him first, you don't have to worry about the rest. But it then goes on to say, after they gave themselves to the Lord, it says they gave themselves to us. And I wanted to read something. I read this story the other day. It's written as a true story. Listen to this. This missionary was trying to really win this tribe to Christ. And you've got to get with their tribal leaders to get permission. I've done that among the Maasai. And I'm sure it's see, Steve's seen a lot of this in Uganda where I'll travel with him, Lord willing, in just a couple of months. So listen to the story quickly. The chief of a very primitive tribe tried to impress the missionary with gifts of horses, blankets, and jewelry. But the missionary said, and I quote, my God wants the chief himself. Then the chief smiled and said, and I quote, you have a very wise God. For when I give him myself, he also gets horses, blankets, and jewelry. <laughs> See, God doesn't need what you have. You need to allow the grace of God to be active in your heart for him. Heard a friend of mine the other day talk about how Jesus one day told his disciples, go into town and in a certain place you will find a donkey. Go in and tell the owner, I have need of it. And by the way, just, just to remind you, Jesus made that donkey. Can I get a witness? He, he made the donkey. But here's what he said. I just want to borrow it. Did you know God doesn't need what you have? But sometimes he likes to borrow what you have since he's in you and use it for his own glory. And so they, they returned that donkey. Matter of fact, if I wanted to just fast forward to the end, there was a day, oh, this is good. He borrowed a tomb. He, he, just, he just needed it for a few days. Yes. Oh, oh, by the way, how would you like to have been Joseph of Arimathea? When you get to heaven, you know, I do plan to go to heaven. I do plan. I'm going to be there a long time, so I'm going to meet a lot of people. Can you imagine when I go up and I say, hey, I lived in 2023, 20, those years like that. Uh, when did you live? Uh, I was in the first century. Really? Yeah. Where did you live? Jerusalem. Tell me your name. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea. And some of you are going to say, never heard of you. <laughs> <laughs> not here, not here. I said I wasn't going to do it anymore. That other church, I had to, all, I had to constantly <laughs> tell the people. But what, what? Joseph, tell, tell them what you did in history. I, I had a beautiful garden and a tomb, and I let him borrow it. And this is good. This is good. He gave it back. Yeah. And by, by the way, by the way, by the way, by the way, he never borrows anything that he doesn't return it. Some of you think, man, if I just obey God, I'm going to be bankrupt. Not a possibility. No way possible. Yes, All right, I'm winding it down. Let me, get, let me get quick. Here we go, quick. They gave themselves to the Lord. Then they gave themselves to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus. Titus the one going around. It's a year later. He's collecting the offering. He said that as he had begun, so he would complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, like you're growing in your faith, you're becoming better in your speech, you have a better understanding of God, you're really, really diligent in your walk and in your love for us, you're loving the, the preacher and the apostles. And I, but then he said this, um, but I want you to abound in this grace also. Here's what he's saying. Uh, you're, you're growing in areas of your life. Look at me. I want you to grow in your giving. 
I want you, all right, New Year's resolutions, I want to lift more weights. I want to walk further, run further, run faster. Whatever your resolution is, let me ask you this, just between us and God, have you ever had this resolution? I want to give more to God's glory this year than I've ever given in my life. I want this to be my best year. I'm going I'm to step it up. We're going to trust God uh, to do that. Janet and I did that in our lives. And there was an ultimate goal we had, and God allowed us to do it in the year of 2017, 2018. We accomplished. I'll leave it right there. All right, listen to this. Two verses. Two verses. I'm going to wrap it up with a story. I speak not by commandment, but I'm testing the sincerity of your love. How? By the diligence of others. Hold on just a moment. You don't find that very much in the Bible. It's like a spiritual competition. He's saying, listen, if you look at the diligence of those that are down in Macedonia, and if you'll compare it to what y'all are doing up there in Corinth, uh, I'm testing your love. Wait a minute. Who said it? I don't know who said it first, but here's what they said. You can give without loving but you can't love without giving. And so, Steve, you better have something for Vicky for her anniversary. I'm going to check with you afterwards. I want to know what you're giving her on third. Now, don't give any this stuff to waiting for the biggie next year. Boast not thyself of the morrow. You know what a day will bring. Do it now. Anything else, Vicky? Was that it? Was that all? Okay. <laughs> All right, here it is, here it is. Here's the key, here's the capstone, the capstone. Verse nine, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for me and you, for your sake, if you've never, you never become a Christian, not a clear verse in the Bible that Jesus died for your sake. He died for your sake. Yes. Jesus paid it all, all to him. Oh. Matter of fact, let me tell you what. Listen carefully, here's a good way to say it. God has served He's waiting on you to respond. Uh, he's sent the Lord Jesus Christ. He shed his blood. He died on the cross. He made perfect provision for your preservation. Now he's waiting for you to respond. And so he says in verse number nine, and though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. I mean, I don't know any other way to say it. Jesus really gave it all. The priority of giving was a reality in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if we, we get to the place where we try to be faithful with the resources God gives us, uh, and we're asking God, what would you have me do? We find out about needs. We find out about mission, um, ministries that mean a great deal to us. And, and, and this is weird. If you, you have to jump ahead, but if I was preaching through the book, I'd finally get to chapter 9. And let me give you a verse, and you can see me after service if you want me to show it to you. But in chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, the Bible says that if you'll be faithful with the grace, the gifts God's already given you, I will make it possible that you can give to all of the needs that come your way. And you, you won't have to, like, Decipher between them. God just supernaturally. And again, you're thinking, how does he do that? Let me tell you what you sang a moment ago. There's beauty. There's beauty in what I can't comprehend. That's what we sang. It's you, Jesus. You're the wonder working God. Somebody said, you know, preacher Hunt said that. No, no, preacher Hunt didn't say it. The word of God said it. So let's quote the one who said it. I, I didn't say it. I can't provide the grace of God. I can only be a recipient. Of grace. But, but everybody gets to where they are in giving because somebody influences them. I wrote five questions, and then I wrote a lesson that takes two hours to teach called the stewardship of influence. And here's what I ask. Listen to this. Everybody in the room can answer this. It's that person, and then I'm going to tell a story I'm through. Who influenced you? Some of you say, boy, my mom's my greatest influence, my sister, my pastor, my Sunday school teacher, a girlfriend, some guy. And then I'd ask another question. When, when did they influence you? And you go back into the time of your life then. How, how did they influence you? Hey, right, here's a good question. Why did they influence you? But this next question, really, it, it sort of makes it known whether you'll ever do anything with the influence. Here it is, question five. What have you done with their influence? 
Someone says, he greatly influenced me. Tell me how. What have you done? What have you done for it? So quickly, I didn't tell it last story. And some of you have heard it, especially all my Woodstock family. And some of you attend other churches now. And we're kind of reconnecting today. But listen to this. Um, I was in poverty, okay, raised on welfare and government project. And that's because if you go to my office downstairs in my house, uh, I'll, if you ever go, I'll show you. I've got the original address letters, the original from where I was raised. I don't want to ever forget. Oh, come on, somebody help me here. I don't want to ever forget where God brought me from. Here, here's what most of us would have, to, would have to admit. God's been better than you than you ever dreamed he would. You, you, come on now, come on. Some of you'd have to say, I never dreamed I'd have what I have. I never dreamed I'd live as long as I've lived. I mean, God has just flat been good to us. Come on. All right, so. Um, the day comes. Janet was 17, 17 days. I was 18. And we got married. I tried to get her to wait, but she just. <laughs> that's not true. All right, so. So here we are, um, we have very little, but I begin to sense that Jesus is calling me to full-time Christian service. By the way, I couldn't tell you that I was called to be a preacher. I just knew God was calling me to ministry. So we sold everything we had, and we moved to Shelby, North Carolina, seven or eight hours away. And I started going to school, and the only way I could get into school is somebody, somebody was able to talk to the president and give us one semester. After one semester, we may have to pile up and come back home. And because you can't get state support for a Christian university. So uh, I'm there. Wouldn't you know, a church asked me if I would fill in for them until their interim could get there. They'd lost faster. An interim was coming. We couldn't be there for about three weeks. I filled in, and by the grace of God, they liked me. You know what they said? They called the interim and said, if you don't mind... We'll keep hunt. I was 23 years old. I'd been saved three years. And then in July of that year, they asked me to be their pastor. All right, look at me. I'm, I'm wrapping up. It's the last story. Here it is. Listen to this. I had one suit. You can be creative. You know, wear the pants, with a, you know, something else, and a different tie. But I had one suit. All right, how about my library? I had my Bible, two red books from Calvary Book Room by uh, Warren Weirdsby, and I had a Matthew Henry commentary. So if you came in and you know I had all those bookshelves, all the shelves, three books up there. And then one day, Janet and I were around the house on an afternoon, I'll never forget, it's an afternoon, and a couple dropped by to see us. And here's what they said. Um, we've been thinking a lot about our two boys today. Well, we knew them pretty good. We didn't know they had any children. And I said, I, I didn't know you had children. And here's what they said. Oh, they both died 45 years ago with kidney disease. And then they said this. I've never heard this before in my life, before or since. They said, we used to kneel by their bassinet, and we would pray that God would make one, if not both, preachers. They said, do you know what our life dream was? We wanted to parent a preacher. I mean, that's emotional. To this day, that's emotional. I've never heard anybody say it. And I thought, that is incredible. And then they said, well, that's why we dropped by. And I'm not tracking. I'm thinking, how do you connect the dots? And they said, uh, we came by because we really believe in you. You're 23 years old. And even back then, I didn't have much education, but they said I had a lot of fire, but not much light. <laughs> so I've been fired up since the day God called me. I'm really, I'm, I didn't get more passion. Jesus put passion. I mean, there's a, there's a fire. It, it shut up in my bones. Can you imagine how hard it's been the last nine months to keep that fire? Under cap. I mean, it, it really has. It's been hard. But listen to this. He said, uh, we want to adopt you and Janet. I said, adopt us? What does that mean? He said, well, we want to buy y'all's clothes. We want to buy you some new shoes. We want to pay for your school. And I want you to see me every two weeks at church. I'm going to give you spending money. Somebody said, well, how did you respond to that? Hello, Dad. Good Lord. How would you respond? I mean, really, so, I mean, and, and really, that's what, what happened. His name's Otis Scruggs. Her name's Biola. I'll never quit telling that story. All right, so look at me. Who influenced me? Otis Scruggs. When? 
college student, broke as a convict. How? Generosity. He didn't just buy me suits. He bought me the best. Bought me floor shine shoes. That was big deal in 1976. Bought me some hush puppies. The real deals. Real hush puppies. <laughs> bought my wife's clothes. Bought my kids' clothes. And then he gave me like two 20s. Every, and and I, only, I only brought home like $49 a, a, a week. So when he came and gave me every two weeks an additional $40, Man, I was flying out. And then he'd take me out to eat about every other day and pay for it. What have I done with it? Look at me. There's no way I could not be generous when God put somebody in my life that demonstrated the grace of God and that gave like that to me. No way, no way, no way. So we get a call. We get a call. Seven years. Trying to quit. Got to get a call. Otis is dying. Matter of fact, they said he's already in a semi-coma. And I said, well, Janet and I are leaving now. It's about seven hours from Raleigh over to Shelby. They said, no, don't come now. By the time you get here, he may be gone and you'll need to come back to do the funeral. So don't come. He won't even know you're here. Look at me. How do you respond to that? I'll know I'm there. You with me? I'll know I'm there. So I go into this room. I pray all the way there, pray all the way there. And I stand at the bottom of his bed. And in my deep voice, I said this, <clears throat> Otis. Otis, and after a moment, I'll never forget it. He's in a gown. He's hooked to all the machines, wires everywhere. His eyes open. I could tell, probably fuzzy to begin with. Then he saw it was me. And I can't tell you what I told him because I couldn't get through it. But I pretty much knew this was my last opportunity to see him alive. And what I did is with all the gratitude graciousness I could muster up. I just said, Otis, I love you. Nobody's ever done for me what you did. I'm able to stay at school. My school's paid for it. I don't go to college a dime for four years. I've got some of the finest threads, nice shoes. My wife has nice dresses. Uh, Holly and Deanna have nice. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be forever. I'll, look at me. I'll never forget this. Now look what he did. It took me a while. Look what he did. He got agitated started moving around and I'm thinking what's he doing and he kept doing this and then it dawned on me every time I saw him he reached for his wallet to give me 220s on his deathbed he was trying to find money in that gown to give me here's what I wrote when I left there here's what I wrote and this is an invitation please hear me please hear me people die the way they live you die stingy. Look at me. You die stingy. You live generous. You die generous. People will talk about you. Otis has been with the Lord. Oh my gosh, Janet, 25 years. And here I am, 25 years later. And by the way, when he met me, when he met me, he didn't know I'd be the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He didn't know that God would let me pastor one of the largest churches in America. I was running 35. He, he didn't invest in me because he thought, fine, boy, this is going to be a, a winner here. Yeah, but all 35 that show up every Sunday. He invested in me because the grace of God, the grace of God. So when I'm, when I'm stingy, all I'm saying is, it is not operative in my life. But when the grace of God, his ability is in you. I really feel strong. I feel strong to do this. Steve's going to come in a moment. But listen to this. Somebody says, we had a 24-year-old lady get saved in the first service. Somebody said, why'd you even bring that up? That's the grace of God. See, the grace of God is not about what I give. Oh, thank you, Jesus. The grace of God is about what God gave. For God so loved the world that he gave. The reason I want to do anything is because of him. and ain't because of me. You take Jesus out of me and I'll be just as stingy and greedy. My attitude will be I want to make all I can, can all I make, and set on the can. But I'm telling you, when Jesus comes in, lids start opening. I mean, you start raising the bar. God starts working in your heart. He starts showing you what. Wait a minute. Don't just sing about a wonder-working God. Let this wonder-working God do wonders in you. But let me tell you where he wants to begin. He wants to save you. So I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Let's, let's pray. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. If you say right now, Pastor Johnny, if I died before nightfall, 
I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven. But I want to settle it. I want to know. Let me speak to you. God loves you. Christ died for you. And Jesus desires to save you this morning. So right there where you sit, why don't you just ask him to save you? Seriously, if you want your sins forgiven, you want to know that you're going to heaven when you die. You want to know that Christ lives in you, gives you the power to live the life that he's called you to. Ask him right now. Just say to him, say it in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, call on him. I need you. I know I cannot save or change myself. So I'm asking you in faith, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin and save me. Thank you for dying for me. Help me to live the rest of my life for you. And thank you today for hearing my prayer and for saving me. We are so excited that today you decided to join us online. We hope today that you were encouraged and blessed by the Word of God and encouraged today to walk with God in a deeper, more intimate way. For some of you, you just prayed that prayer with us. You just invited Jesus Christ to come into your heart. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, do you realize that Jesus just saved you? Your sins just got forgiven. And that is the greatest thing in all the world. Matter of fact, the Bible says that all of heaven throws a party because you just said yes to Jesus Christ. And so we want to encourage you to read the Bible, to pray, to find you a, a church home that you may be involved in, or even on this online campus we've got going on here. Or I want to encourage you, if you just prayed that prayer, to let us know about that. Matter of fact, you can text your response to 470-509-5139. I want to encourage you to do that right now. Don't wait. You don't have to think about it. If you just pray that prayer, text that response to us and let us know, and then we will get back with you and help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, thanks for watching us online.